A reading from the second letter of St. John. Chosen Lady, I rejoiced greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. But now, Lady, I ask you, not as though I were writing a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning. Let us love one another. For this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, as you heard from the beginning, in which you should walk. Many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. Such is the deceitful one and the Antichrist. Look to yourselves that you do not lose what we work for, but may receive a full recompense. Anyone who is so progressive as not to remain in the teaching of the Christ does not have God. Whoever remains in the teaching has the Father and the Son. The word of the Lord. Blessed are they who follow the law of the Lord. Blessed are they whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they who observe his decrees, who seek him with all their heart. With all my heart I seek you, let me not stray from your commands. Within my heart I treasure your promise, that I may not sin against you. Be good to your servant, that I may live and keep your words. Open my eyes, that I may consider the wonders of your law. Lexia Sancti Evangelii Secundum Lucam. Gloria Jesus said to his disciples, As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day that Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Similarly, as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating, drinking, buying, selling, planting, building on the day when Lot left Sodom. Fire and brimstone rained from the sky to destroy them all. So it will be on the day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, someone who is on the housetop and whose belongings are in the house must not go down to get them. And likewise, one in the field must not return to what was left behind. Remember the wife of Lot. Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it, but whoever loses it will save it. I tell you, on that night, there will be two people in one bed. One will be taken, the other left. And there will be two women grinding meal together. One will be taken, the other left. They said to him in reply, Where, Lord? He said to them, Where the body is, 
there also the vultures will gather. Verbum Domini. Today we celebrate a great missionary saint, an Italian woman, Saint Francis, or Mother Francis Xavier Cabrini, and she did great work here in the United States and elsewhere, <clears throat> and had a great zeal to help the poor and those, especially in this country, largely the Italian immigrants who were coming and unchurched, and uh, was sent here by the Holy Father at the time. She was born in 1850, 1850 and then died in 1917. She was from the Piedmont region of Italy. And as a child, her father would read to her stories of great missionaries. And she, as a young girl, wanted to go to China. And she would dress her dolls up as nuns and make little paper boats and put violets in them and send them off to faraway lands. And as a religious, she added Xavier to her middle name, Francis Xavier Cabrini, because he is the patron of foreign missionaries. She had such a longing and a desire for this. Her mother had frail health, and she also as well, Mother Cabrini had frail health. And twice she was refused by religious orders in Italy because of her health, and then a parish priest asked her to form an orphanage and a school at his parish, and that too failed. And then finally the priest encouraged her to form a missionary order uh, of women. And in 1880, she formed the Missionaries of the Sacred Heart to run schools and orphanages for the poor. You know, still with a desire to go to the East and be a missionary, but the Pope told her, you know, not to the East, but to the West. And they had a bishop in the United States that wanted her to come because they had all these Italian immigrants who uh, were struggling, you know, very poor and did not have the faith being taught to them. So in 1899, she came to New York to work among the 50,000 Italian immigrants there, and as I mentioned, most of whom were unchurched. She would go on to found orphanages, schools, convents in New York, Managua, Nicaragua, uh, New Orleans, Chicago, Buenos Aires, Argentina. Um, I was reading a letter where she was up in Alaska, <laughs> you know, talking about the Inuit there. And uh, in Denver, if you go to Denver to this day near Red Rocks Auditorium, they had a, I believe it was an orphanage up there, and they have preserved the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the stones laid out on top of the mountain there. And it's a, just an incredible testament of faith to someone who is considered poor health. And she has these marvelous letters. I was reading through some of them, uh, just traveling. You know, at that time, much more difficult to travel than today, and all the hardships they're in, but just going to the ends of the earth in and she, because these steamer voyages you know, took so long, she had time to write these letters. So there's beautiful accounts of her observations of the great natural beauty that she saw like in Nicaragua, Nicaragua and things. And uh, it, was, it was beautiful to see her, her reflections on that. And she's writing to her sisters largely, I think. So she also gives little spiritual counsels to them as well. She would say, you know, a woman of frail health doing all these great works, she would say, are we doing this or is the Lord? And she would say that she's not even the instrument of the Lord. She said, Lord, you are the one who acts. I am not even an instrument in your hands, as others say. You alone are the one who does all. And, I'm, and I am nothing more than a spectator of the great and wonderful works that you know how to accomplish. You know, in our writings, you continually see, you know, this love for Jesus, that that is her goal and motivation, to 
to serve the Lord. You know, in Alaska, I think it was Alaska, she compared, you know, the, like the gold rush, the gold miners would go to the ends of the earth to find trace amounts of gold and would not give up. And she said, how much more for the salvation of souls? You know, should we have that zeal? A missionary of great activity, but also a person of deep prayer, you know, that drew her strength from the Lord. She would say that prayer is that powerful weapon that must defend and help you, not only now, but throughout your lives. It is the key to heavenly treasures, the channel through which graces descend. As long as you pray, you will be safe. Pray for yourselves, for the persons entrusted to your care, for those dear to you, for society, for the church. Make prayer a habit, because if you succeed in experiencing the sweetness found in this intimate conversation of the soul with God, there will never be hours of discouragement and despair, nor will clouds long disturb the calm horizon of your souls. The saints always speak about prayer, the importance of that, and how that is the source of their strength. She would counsel one of her religious daughters. She said, why, dearest daughter, do you waste time in sadness when time is so precious for the salvation of poor sinners? Get rid of your melancholy immediately. Don't think any more about yourself. Do not indulge in so many useless and dangerous reflections. Look ahead, always without ever looking back. Keep your gaze fixed on the summit of perfection where Christ awaits you. He wants you despoiled of all things, intent only on procuring his greater glory during this brief time of your existence. For the short time that remains, it is worthwhile to lose yourself for the short time that remains, is it worthwhile to lose yourself in melancholy like those who think only of themselves, as if all were to end with this life? I thought that's addressing a deep problem of our age, right? The turning to the self, focusing on ourselves, getting discouraged. Instead of keeping our eyes on the Lord, serving where he's called us to serve in our families, marriages, communities, in whatever way, you know, for the greater glory of God. When we take our eyes off of the Lord and his motivation, you know, we can quickly become discouraged and get so attached to the things of this passing world, you know, that can hold us back and keep us down. St. John, in his letter today, the first reading, he warns us not to be so progressive, in quotes, as not to remain in the teaching of the Christ, as to not remain in the teaching of the Christ does not have God. Whoever remains in the teaching has the Father and the Son. That we can never leave aside the commandments. And that's a great mission field in our culture today. You know, to proclaim the gospel of Christ, that it does not change. You know, cultural values change, relativism, you know, is everywhere today. And as a Christian, we can't go with that tide. We can't flow with that stream and embrace the things that uh, the world embraces, the fallen world embraces. So he warns us to walk according to his commandments. And when we do that, we're walking in accordance with love of God and love of neighbor, you know, the foundation of the commandments. And as we take that path, we grow closer to the Lord. So yes, it's prayer, and it's also living these teachings of Christ. She's a model and patron of migrants and immigrants, you know, and taking care of the least. You know, it's a powerful exhortation for us, you know, to welcome those who are struggling and suffering, and also to proclaim that gospel. That that's the greatest treasure that we could give to others and the teachings of Christ, to witness to what we have experienced in our own lives, to help others to find him as well. We also, we have a first-class relic of Mother Cabrini here. 
So today we ask her especially to pray for America and that we may uh, serve the Lord in his kingdom in the most generous way.